Professor Dino in Malaysia asks, The spike of the subprime-related problems was spread out by the QEs, maybe for 20 to 30 years into the future. If the situation in America does not develop into total anarchy with food riots, etc., do you think that the other likely scenario would be a long, drawn-out recession slash hyperinflation? Well, you know, first of all, I don't buy the premise that the QE has postponed the consequences for 20 years. I mean, it's postponed them for a few years, but I don't think it's going to be 20. I think that we're going to deal with the consequences much sooner than that. And, you know, whether it ultimately becomes hyperinflation or not, I think that's still uh, up in the air. It depends on whether or not we actually confront these problems and do the right thing. I think that there's going to be higher inflation uh, before we do the right thing. I just don't know whether it's going to progress to the point of hyperinflation. That's certainly the course we're on now. And if we don't veer from it, that what is that is what will happen. But I'm hopeful uh, that we will veer from it eventually. But I do think there's going to be a lot of pain. I think what's happening in Europe right now is just a small sampling of what's going to happen here. I think we have a bigger case of the disease, and I think we're going to have uh, even worse symptoms as uh, as it unfolds. Uh, so we have to prepare for that. But I, you know, I'm still optimistic that ultimately, you know, when we've got no other choice, uh, we'll, we'll finally do the right thing. Maybe it'll be obvious to some people. Uh, the costs of continuing to do the wrong thing. But a lot of damage has been done. We have years of bad policy. Our economy is, 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 is screwed up uh, because of all these malinvestments, because of the artificially low interest rates. And we're going to have to come to terms with that and you know, swallow the bitter pasty medicine that is necessary to cure uh, this very, very sick economy. Max in Toronto, Ontario asks, One thing I'm often attacked upon is the principle of socialized health care in Canada versus the private health care of the USA. People often say, if someone is dying and can't afford health care, you would just let them die? Is there any advice that you could give me to counter this argument or understand how capitalism counters this? Sure. I mean, this is a short segment. I would suggest you read my new book, The Real Crash. I have an entire chapter on health care, and I address that concern. Uh, but basically, first, the U.S. is not really an example of the private market. We don't really have free enterprise in health care. Government is extremely involved in the U.S. health care industry, in the insurance industry, and that is why health care is so expensive. It's because the government has superimposed itself and doesn't allow the free market to function in health care the way it does in other areas of the economy where we don't see runaway uh, prices. And uh, you're talking about, will in a free market, will sick people simply be allowed to die if they can't afford medicine? Well, in a free market, medicine would be a lot less expensive. Healthcare would be a lot more affordable. So more people wouldn't be facing that predicament. But to the extent that there were still people that were so poor that even in a much more efficient private health care system where health care was less expensive, even those people who couldn't afford it, they wouldn't be allowed to die. There would be pre- plenty of private charities that would take care of them. That's exactly what happened in the past. It'll happen again. And doctors are very charitable. Uh, they often work for free. The problem is right now, so much of their time is dealing with lawsuits, uh, dealing with insurance companies, that they don't have the free time uh, to deal with poor, sick people that they would have if we had a free market where they didn't have to waste all their time in bureaucratic and legal red tape. And if they, you know, they, they would have the, the, the wherewithal and the ability to take care of the people who truly fall through the cla- cracks in a free market. And again, that is exactly the way it was in the past before the government got involved. And that's the way it would be in the future if we got the government out of health care. Brian in Kuzmar, Florida asks, can you explain the correlation of problems in Europe with falling prices in precious metals? Well, the precious metal price, I think, has come under pressure because the concerns about the euro have caused people to buy the dollar. And it's been the relative strength of the dollar versus the euro that I think has undermined the short-term case for gold in the mind of a lot of investors. They see this dollar strength and they sell gold. I also think the price of gold has been weighed down by the performance of gold stocks. I think gold traders have anticipated a huge collapse in the price of gold, and so they sold off gold stocks in advance of that anticipated decline. 
Now, the decline hasn't actually happened yet. I mean, gold prices are off, but not nearly as much by as much as you would imagine is being baked into uh, the gold stocks. And I think that has actually spooked uh, the, the market for gold, thinking that, hey, what, what do the gold traders know? The gold stock traders know they're really anticipating a collapse and, you know, maybe they're right. So I think that's also hurt the psychology uh, for gold. And just in general, markets have been under pressure, uh, including the gold market. I think, though, that people are mistaken. If they think the dollar is a sounder alternative to the euro, they're wrong. Whatever problems exist in Europe, and I'm not going to undermine the severity of those problems, they're real. But I think our problems are worse. And so I don't think the dollar is a safe haven. And I think this sell-off in gold is a buying opportunity. And I think the sell-off in gold stocks is an even better buying opportunity. Shane in Cedar City, Utah asks, you always say that interest rates have to eventually rise, but can't the Fed just keep buying the excess bonds for as long as they want and keep the rates as low as they want as long as they want? Well, your, your underlying premise is wrong. The Federal Reserve cannot keep interest rates low indefinitely because they cannot buy all the treasures they want. Now, in the short run, they've been able to do that because confidence remains in the dollar and confidence remains in the willingness and the ability of the Fed to fend off future inflation. But at some point, the world is going to lose confidence because by creating all this money, to buy dollars, to buy bonds rather, they do cause the dollar to lose value and prices rise. And for now, uh, people are not really appreciating uh, the, the extent of that rise. And some of it is being masked by the fact that a lot of the bonds or a lot of the dollars that the Fed is printing are being held offshore by foreign central banks. And therefore that mitigates the impact that those dollars would otherwise have on consumer prices here in America. But at some point, prices will be rising to the extent that the world expects the Fed to tighten. And when they don't, then confidence is lost in the value of the dollar and interest rates are gonna rise uh, no matter what the Fed does. Now, ultimately, can the Fed buy all the bonds at, and, and keep interest rates low? Well, let's say they do that, then the dollar completely collapses and it has no value, then what good are they? Does it matter if the government can still borrow dollars if those dollars deliver no purchasing power uh, when, when people receive them? Of course not. So there is a limit. You know, if Federal Reserves or central banks rather really could keep interest rates low indefinitely simply by printing money, then no countries would ever see spikes in their interest rates, at least no countries that possess printing presses. But the reality is it's the countries that do have printing presses that do print a lot of money that ultimately see the biggest increases in interest rates. And I think the same thing is going to happen here in America. Vitaly in Montclair, New Jersey asks, when I discuss the present currency bond bubble with my wife, she often says not to attribute to malice what can be attributed to stupidity. I, however, reverse that and say never to attribute to stupidity what probably is malice. In your opinion, is the government that dumb or are they following some plan to make a killing on the currency collapse? I don't think they're smart enough to figure out how to make a killing on the currency collapse, let alone forecast the currency collapse. So I don't think there's a grand conspiracy on the part of our leaders to deliberately destroy the economy. I mean, their policies may lead to the destruction of our economy, but I don't think it's because they want that to happen. Now, I do believe that most of our leaders care more about their own reelection than the long-term health of our economy. And so they're willing to pursue policies that further their own political careers rather than advancing uh, you know, a, 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 an economic agenda that is pro-growth and, 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 and is something that we, we need. And so you can say there that they're not really acting in our self-interest or acting in their own uh, political preservation. But I don't believe that they, that they understand or can connect the dots between what they're doing and how bad it's going to get. I still think that there are economic advisors in Washington who are telling our leaders that what they're doing is the right thing, that we need more government spending, uh, that we need more printing, that we need to stimulate demand. So there, are, there, is, a, there is an argument that is being made uh, that what is in the political interest of our leaders is also 
in the interest of the country. And I'm sure that there are many in Washington who actually believe that. I mean, they're wrong. But look, there are Nobel Prize winning economics that believe this nonsense. So if there are people with Nobel Prizes that believe it, uh, it certainly stands to reason that some congressmen can believe it. Even, you know, they don't even have Nobel Prizes. And, uh, but I, I don't think they deliberately want to hurt the country. Now, do our leaders take advantage of a crisis when it comes about? Sure. Are they going to use a crisis to advance their agenda, to deprive us of our liberty so that more decisions can be made in Washington? Yes, they'll do that. Now, a lot of politicians think, think it's in our, our best interest. A lot of politicians think we're little kids, that we can't make our own decisions, that we need the government to do it for us. The government needs to protect us because if left to our own devices, we would all kill ourselves, poison ourselves, bankrupt ourselves, that we have to listen to the government because we don't know what's good for ourselves. And that is an attitude, it's an elitist attitude that probably permeates Washington. Uh, and it's unfortunate, but it's there. But, you know, is it a deliberate conspiracy? Do they, do they want to destroy the country? No. Are there policies contributing to the destruction? Yes, but I think it's more, uh, it's, it's happening by accident. It's the unintended consequences of, of what they're doing. Sometimes they mean well, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. But it doesn't mean that the road doesn't get you to hell. And it doesn't matter what the intentions are of the people who are laying down that asphalt. Uh, what counts is where the road is taking us and where we end up.